folks. I apologize. Just need to give me a second here. I'm trying to get the uh, the riff to want to play nice. Uh, no device attached. That's not good. <laughs> I've had like a oh hey there we go. I've had a streak of really good luck doing these kind of demos, and I just knew that tonight it would just come <laughs> to a screeching and flaming halt. But it looks like we might be okay here. Um, out of curiosity, like who here has an Oculus? Okay, all right. Has anyone here tried Moz VR or tried Web VR yet? Okay, cool. So Tony was totally right. Uh, he suggested I kind of show you some of the things that have been built so far because for some of you it may be the first time seeing this. Um, I'm actually gonna get my water. Um, I'm gonna walk and talk because I can totally do that. Thank you. Um, so my name is Josh Carpenter. Uh, I was a, I'm a Mozilla employee. I'm one of a very small team at Mozilla working on web VR. Uh, my partner in this is, is Vlad, um, who, uh, Vlad Kitchevik. God, I gotta get better at that. Um, and Vlad was a co-creator of WebGL. Uh, and so Vlad and Brandon, uh, uh, over the past summer, uh, created these APIs that Tony was referring to that have enabled all of this. That was kind of the starting gun. And really what I want to talk about today is where do we go next? And what is the kind of the next logical progression in the step towards uh, the metaverse, if you want to think of it that way? Um, or if you just want to think about how can we make WebVR a little bit less painful, a little bit more creatively empowering for developers? Um, so I'm going to hop around between four different tabs today and then a bunch of preview slides. This is going to be just awesome, and it's probably going to explode. So, um, All right, so what can we do today? Um, I'll show you MozVR really quick. This is the site that... Uh, we made, ah, there, right off the bat. All right, let's see here. Boom. Is this it? Yes, all right. All right, so this is the site that we made internally, and really what our goal here was, well, just for me, it was just when I should really learn WebGL and 3JS if I'm gonna work on this. I previously was a lead designer on Firefox OS, which is a web-based operating system. So we really thought deeply about, you know, what is the web really special? Uh, what makes the web special? What would you want in a web-based operating system? Um, but uh, to me, WebGL was pretty new. Done a lot of 3D, a lot of motion graphics, but our teams had to get acclimated with the tool set. Uh, the second thing was we wanted to try and explore what uh, VR browsing might actually be like. So what we have here on this site is if you have a VR version of Firefox, which you can get from mozvr.com, uh, we have a site that essentially is a collection of demos created by ourselves and a bunch of partners we worked with, including Leap Motion, uh, Tony's team, uh, pretty amazing documentarians, the LVR team who are phenomenal. They're based in San Francisco as well. We made a bunch of individual demos, and then MozVR allows you to actually browse through them. Um, I don't have the camera hooked up here, but uh, essentially this is kind of like web design as architecture or space planning. Um, as a designer, this was a pretty phenomenally, mind-blowingly fun process, trying to figure out uh, yeah, how do I fill this space, and what does a link look like, how do I interact with things in a 3D volume. Um, for example, I don't, again, I don't have the camera, but that text is pretty hard to read in a DK2, that little instruction panel, but the wonderful thing about virtual reality is you can actually lean in and read it perfectly. So the implications for interaction design are just mind-blowing, to have someone able to walk around your space or physically lean in and read text and things like that. Interaction model is really basic. Uh, we look at things and we click on them. We're working on a more elaborate cursor, but for V1, you know, MVP, this was the way to go. So if, for example, I want to maybe play this documentary, I look at it, and with my gamepad or with my mouse, I can just click on it. We play a transition. We say a little bit about the incoming site, and the incoming coming site gets pulled in. Uh, everything you're seeing are being pulled off of GitHub servers, except the actual master itself, which is running off my local host, but this is all running at mozvr.com. Uh, you're essentially seeing, for the technical in the audience, you're seeing two iframes stacked on top of one another. The top iframe presents the, the HUD, the UI, which I'll show you in a second, and the back iframe shows you what you're seeing right now, which is the content. And by stacking these two iframes and kind of covering up the back with the front, we can uh, uh, approximate the look of actually browsing from site to site to site seamlessly. Uh, so that transition you saw, that kind of black-white with that white grid, that's kind of a site transition we're playing with. Um, so this is a documentary being made right now. This is the LVR WebGL video player. Uh, this is just an MP4 echo rectangular map onto a sphere, really straightforward. Uh, this documentarian team uh, contacted me out of the blue uh, and said, we've got this amazing documentary, we'd love to give you the trailer for this. So this is being shot in the Arctic right now, and it kind of shows the educational potential of virtual reality because this you know, can transport a student into a place in the world they would never normally go. You know, one of my the things I love about VR, its potential is as a tool for empathy. Like nothing else that could make us feel like we were in these places. We're actually you know, in a place like uh, uh, West Africa in an Ebola crisis or, or in the north and actually witnessing the change in the Arctic happening right now. 
So the kind of the part we're really proud of with Moz VR is now if I want to change sites, I don't have to exit VR. I don't have to type in anything into the URL bar. I can just hit spacebar. And we've got this heads-up display. And essentially, the heads-up display just lets us look at these links and click on them. So for example, I want to go to Seashelt here. Click on it. Again, we have a site transition. And we just go from one scene to the next. Totally seamlessly. Again, no need to take off our headsets. Um, virtual reality from day one is going to be mobile. Um, Oculus has said they'll have desktop uh, capability, but also I think the default will be mobile, which is to say all in one, which is to say you never want to have to take off your headset to do anything. So it will not be tethered like it is right now into this desktop. So it's really important for the web to have that capability and for us to start thinking about that now, which I'll say a lot more about in a second. Uh, so again, you can go to mozvr.com and see all this. It's all up there right now. Um, there's a limitation here, which is pretty obvious. Uh, you can't go anywhere from anywhere. You can only go where we let you go. You can only go to the links that are actually in this heads-up display. So that's one of the things I want to talk about today, one of the things we have to figure out as a community, how are we going to let people go anywhere from anywhere. Okay, so mozvr.com. Just going to close that. Um, okay, so the web, the uh, strengths of the web. Again, I mentioned the things we really love about the web. It's decentralized. It's, it's completely ubiquitous. Uh, interoperability, safety, openness, um, links, which are fantastic, and then ease of development, which Tony really uh, touched on in a great way. Um, there's been a lot of hand-wringing about the decline of the web, or you'll see some kind of what I would think are misinformed articles about the decline of the web because the browser has declined in proportional market share of time spent on our digital devices. I think that's, that's ludicrous. The browser was never the web. The web has speciated. You know? It's divided into a million different life forms and manifestations from RSS feeds to push notifications to embedded web views to, uh, to any number of different uh, touch points. Like everything that we interact with is the web. So the web has won utterly and completely. It's ex succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. It was never just the browser. So I think the web is in an extremely, extremely strong place today, as this slide says. Um, now, and virtual reality is, is mind-blowing, but uh, as Tony pointed out, there's a couple things that I think we would all agree are shortcomings with early VR. Um, fragmented market, it, it's really, it's so easy to make a headset, and these handset manufacturers are highly motivated to because many of them are facing pretty declining profits. So you can make, the hardware is easy. Some of it's even open source because Oculus has been very good about open sourcing some of the DK1 stuff. Uh, so we're looking at kind of an uncertain roadmap and a fragmented roadmap, probably a lot of different headsets out there. Uh, a high skill level for even a basic project. You gotta use Unity or Unreal for the most part. Um, consumption, uh, you have friction. There's installs, and God knows what's in those installs. You gotta go to Oculus Share or something like that. And then lastly, private sector control. I, I am not a, an ideologue about open. I like an, in a, a mixed stack of open and closed, and lots of economic opportunities for everybody. I believe very strongly in that. I like app stores, and I like open. I like suburbs, and I like downtowns. Um, but I think that right now we're kind of tilted, obviously, pretty far in the private sector control uh, side of things. And I think VR is too important. It's, it's a medium. It's too important to leave any one company, any one, company any one entity. So I think we want to see uh, an open layer there across uh, VR. And I would argue that most of these organizations want the same thing. I know Oculus is embracing uh, WebGL, I think, for the sake of their, uh, their desktop distribution interface, uh, although it's all rumor and hearsay based on Connect. But um, I think they would agree uh, that we want an open layer across all of this. So looking at the strengths of the web and then looking at where VR right now is maybe a bit, uh, has some holes in it, uh, I think we would agree that we want it to be more webby. So I want to be able to go anywhere from anywhere instantly. So no longer having these, these, like, these hermetically sealed applications that have very little, if any, awareness of one another, but uh, uh, a VR of links, of small units of content bound together by links, uh, and moving between those and in a way that's safe. You know, these user agents, these browsers are nice sandboxes and they keep us safe most of the time. Uh, ease of development, obviously. I can make something, share it with everybody, and I know that no matter what headset you have, you can actually fire it up and, look, and it'll work on it. And then tapping into that massive long tail of web content, uh, there's billions of websites. Let's make it easy for devs to leverage it and bring it into the applications. And lastly, like I said, interoperability. Um, I talked to an executive in our company and uh, who will go unnamed, and I'm like, we gotta start working on a browser. And uh, he said, why, the browser's commoditized. And I had to kind of try and explain to him, like a pioneer might explain to like a rich guy back east in New York in like the 1700s, 1800s, like there are no roads out here. The things you take for granted do not exist yet. We haven't figured out how a back button works. We haven't figured out how a URL bar works. We have not figured out the most basic things. So you're talking about commoditization. I seek commoditization. I would love commoditization. I want to see the commoditization of the web in virtual reality. So no matter what kind of developer you are, no matter what your aspirations are, you can integrate the web in your application. You can build entire economies and entire companies and entire services 
on top of the web. I think that's what we, what we should all collectively seek. Once we've got that, we can all go make a bunch of startups. We can all go do whatever it is we want to do on top of it. But right now, the web is not there. And so if it's not there, it, there's a high degree of risk, I think, in it getting left behind. Uh, maybe the way, well, even maybe worse than it was left behind in mobile, because there are some more inherent challenges in VR. Um, let's commoditize the web for VR. So in terms of how we do that, well, there's kind of a, a lot of people have been thinking for a long time about what the metaverse is. Um, you'll see these amazing, mind-blowing, very comprehensive thought exercises and products, and op some open source, some closed, into what a metaverse might look like. Uh, and so, for example, they, uh, High Fidelity, uh, Second Life, very notably, um, there's a couple of really neat ones out there. Um, uh, those are kind of attempts, I think, to, to start from scratch, for the most part, uh, which is totally le legitimate. It's a really good thought exercise. The approach that, that, that being at Mozilla and being a platform guy who is a steward in, of the web we have, the approach that we want to take is kind of taking this oil tanker and kind of turning it by a couple of degrees at a time, pointing it towards VR. So I want to try to think about incremental steps that we can take to get us towards that end goal, while more nimble, smaller teams uh, innovate on the UX side and innovate on the, the VR side without the encumbrances of the web. So the metaphor I use is if the web's like an oil tanker, you kind of want a bunch of speedboats in front of it who are doing the mine sweeping and are doing kind of the, finding the good paths for us to follow. So Janus VR is a really neat project out there. It's, it's webby, it's very webby, but it's not quite the web. But it's, that's good because um, James, who's running it, isn't encumbered by all the encumbrances of the web. So he can do neat stuff. He can do links as portals, for example. Another good example is Darknet, which is a really mind-blowing VR experience. And Darknet is like a rendering of what the web might be someday, maybe in 10 years. And so he's at the frontier of creativity while we're kind of back find, trying to enable the base stuff. So I think it's a really healthy relationship we're seeing right now. I think that's how the web's going to move forward. So my talk will be on kind of the, not links as portals, but more the, the next logical steps in the process. Uh, so first is VR native browsing. I mentioned with mozvr.com, you can't go anywhere from anywhere. We've got to fix that. So you should be able to type in a URL with your headset on. You should be able to go back with your headset on. If you want to log into something, you should be able to type it in to that, that login field. Uh, just the fundamentals of browsing, should, you should be able to do them with your headset on without any external dependencies. Uh, second, backwards compatibility. If you're going to go anywhere from anywhere, it stands to reason that most of anywhere is classic sites. You know, we've got billions of mobile sites and desktop sites, and we're not going to stop making them either. No matter how successful VR is, like, there's still going to be people buying new phones in five years. I've got, actually, I've got a standing bet with a coworker that Apple will still be selling OS 10 desktops in now nine years. And I don't know if, I don't know how I feel about that, but it's, you know, it seems like a reasonable bet. And these will probably be 2D. So we're gonna continue to make 2D content. We have to have a way to interact with it and access it from VR. And then obviously full VR sites, because conversely, a web full of 2D planes would suck, and it would be a catastrophic failure of imagination. And I think it would limit the impact that the web can have in virtual reality if we don't go beyond just 2D planes. So how can we make really great full VR sites? Um, and just to throw in a bit of like, for us to think about, like the web has never tried to compete or has never competed very successfully toe to toe with bleeding edge native. I tried to build an operating system on top of the web. I know how hard it is to compete with a really great native experience. <laughs> it's very difficult. So I think we have to be smart here and think about um, what is the web gonna be good at? Like uh, maybe we leave it to John Carmack and the guys to enable the bleeding edge AAA Call of Duties of VR, and we figure out what the web can be uniquely good at, and then find out like what is the good enough performance level of the web in virtual reality. So let's figure out where we want the web to compete, and then figure out what's good enough for that. Again, it does not have to be bleeding edge. It doesn't have to be the top tier. It doesn't have to be 120 uh, hertz, for example. Um, let's figure out what a good level is uh, for full VR sites. And then lastly, just uh, again, for the sake of commoditization, more device support, more embeddability, uh, and better performance, uh, just continually, continually making it better. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit we can do here. I know that Brandon and my colleague Vlad are both talking about uh, like fast pass in the browser for latency. Uh, right now, there's a couple things we do in the browser that don't need to be done for VR necessarily that would actually really help with latency times. I think Vlad said we're at like 60 milliseconds for latency. We want to get down to 20, so we have to make that better, right? Um, and then embeddability. So like I said before, anyone who wants to make a VR uh, app can uh, use the web. And device support, more HMDs. Like we should be HMD agnostic. We want it to work everywhere. 
uh, and also input devices. Uh, we don't even know what the default for CV1 will be, so we have to hedge our bets and make sure we support a wide range of devices. And luckily, web APIs in the last couple of years, in part thanks to Firefox OS and other efforts, have gotten much more robust. So uh, we just released a web API, I think, for uh, on Firefox, I think, for voice control, or it's coming very soon. Uh, so we got some pretty cool stuff for WebRTC, for example, or camera control, or local storage, or battery life. Like the web is better now than it's ever been at actually talking to hardware. So we want to get that information out there and continue to make it more robust for virtual realities, maybe depth sensors, things like that. Um, now, this is the part of my presentation where I have to remember, I have to start dancing between slide decks. Um, so, uh, yeah, here we go. These are just a bunch of, I've been lots of experimentation, lots of experiments. This stuff will all be online um, at a link I'll share later. Um, first thing is backwards compatibility. Um, that seems to be one of the first things we need to figure out. So. Uh, we've been playing with different models. Um, what we kind of want to do tonight, and in a blog post we'll send up on Tuesday, is begin a conversation in the community about what's going to make sense and what's going to empower developers. Um, so for backwards compatibility, like the default should just be render the site faithfully, uh, maybe apply it to a plane, have like a virtual viewport inside a cropped viewport, just like we have on mobile, so that the virtual viewport can be pinched and zoomed. Because legibility kind of sucks in VR, so you're actually going to want to lean into content or make it larger. It seems to me to make sense to also curve it around the user. So we've been playing around with models where there's actually some curvature uh, around the user here. Um, I think we're going to have to figure out uh, just how much content we can pack into it. So for example, this is a, a Medium article. That's really hard to read in a DK2 with its resolution. Um, it seems like it's going to be quite a few years before resolution really gets good enough in these headsets to make looking at text really palatable. But we should still be able to do it. So uh, what we're playing around with is a, a virtual viewport inside a cropped viewport, a uh, curved surface approximately 50 centimeters away from the user. Uh, and uh, that's just the default. So a web author doesn't have to do anything whatsoever to their existing site, and they'll get this sort of behavior. And there's some more details there we can get into about how it would actually work, and we'll get into in a second. Uh, so we've just been doing legibility tests, like, okay, well, Wikipedia, how the heck would this actually work? Um, these links would all have to work, by the way, so we'll need some sort of cursor system. Uh, clicking on links would work, mouse events should work, scrolling should work, like the fundamentals of web inter interaction have to be recreated. The job, I think, is not unlike what the mobile Safari team had to do in 2005, or whatever the hell they were doing it which is to say, to take the content uh, of one medium and crunch it down to a different form factor, and then come up with adaptive interactions and, and display techniques to make it palatable. So what is the pinch, of, pinch to zoom of VR? You know, wh what is that going to be? And so again, we're just doing lots of little copy and paste exercises internally, trying to figure out what the information density can be and what might, what might be promising techniques for VR web design. Uh, this is literally just the Wikipedia page, for example. And this, to give you a sense of scale, like me looking up here is now me craning my neck up to try and read a website. Like that's not necessarily that pleasant, but uh, maybe it works better if it's smaller, uh, or if we can actually shrink the content down by doing those pinch to zoom actions. But again, this is like the default backwards compatibility mode. Um, uh, then there's full VR site. So a full VR site would be a site that has complete control of everything the user sees, hears, and does. So those Moz VR sites I showed you, that's full VR. The viewport expands to take over the full 360 degree space. Uh, you're not cropped to anything. You are now in a world. You know? That is, I think, what we want a VR website to be. And hopefully we'll see a lot of those created. We have to think about what the enablers for those will be. Uh, and then between those two extremes, I think there's a really, really interesting place, which is if I'm Wikipedia, I'm not going to convert the gazillions of individual pages or the gazillions of individual style sheets I have to be these wonderful full VR worlds. But I also don't want to be like this. This is kind of, this a uh, couple slides back is kind of crappy, um, especially this one, you know? Um, so how can we enable developers to do what they like, web developers to do what is a best practice anyways, which is to use responsive design techniques to actually adapt to the form factor. Um, we're trying to find these neat little judo moves and propose them to the community for responsive uh, VR design. So like one, for example, is, um, well, I mean, I, was I showed you this Wikipedia process, but if I know that I'm with in VR, if I know I'm being presented on this kind of curved surface with kind of rectangular orientation, perhaps I switch to CSS columns and actually begin to display content in kind of a left-right orientation. Um, uh, for example, perhaps I actually increase the text size, which isn't shown here, but text size being low, maybe I beef it up a little bit. Um, one that really, really excites me is all this stuff here. This is like the equivalent of the status bar in, uh, in uh, iOS or Android. That's just, that's, that's user agent space. Um, and, but like iOS and Android, perhaps we can enable developers to actually uh, tell the user agent what they want to put there. So maybe there's a CSS tag that enables the developer to say, all right, viewport background is this, and they can actually drop in an echo rectangular image, for example, and then maybe they can make their content transparent. So this is a really, as a visual designer, this really pains me to be showing you really early crappy work like this, but 
Um, maybe it's like this, where imagine that uh, I've got that, that curved viewport is still present, but uh, uh, it's now the background of that curved viewport has now been made transparent. And we've also used a CSS property to actually drop a background image into the background there. And it says Tahrir Square, and it shows Stonehenge. Like I said, it's really embarrassingly work in progress. <laughs> My our CTO is like, I have to point out one thing. I'm like, I know, I know, I know. Um, I, uh, but uh, I think you can get a lot of mileage out of transparent content on a curved surface with something in the background, like a ton of mileage. In fact, the reason I'm confident to this is that's precisely how I've been doing uh, our internal. Uh, one second. Uh, I need to make this less or more legible. See what I did there? This is how I've internally been doing our mockups. So Moz VR, uh, the way I actually built these was in Illustrator. Uh, Apply to all, ignore. Uh, in Illustrator, what I've been doing is I've been making these canvases that are 360 centimeters wide and 90 centimeters tall. And then I make them into, I put them on a cylinder surface, which is 50 centimeters radius, and I kind of wrap them around the user. And so I get to work in 2D, and I know exactly, because this is all based on centimeters, exactly where the center is and where right behind me will be on the respective edges. And then I just make the background transparent, I drop a neck rectangular image, and you get a ton of mileage out of this, especially once you start making multiple layers. And you say, right, well, these bookmarks, let's drop them back five centimeters, and let's make this thing five centimeters forward. Again, we can do that with CSS 3D transitions. And in VR, that subtle five centimeter separation becomes as obvious as like a drop shadow in 2D composition. It's incredibly, incredibly powerful. So there's just one example of how with a couple, with the ability to detect the context, uh, we can actually customize our style sheets to optimize for VR. I think what we have to do first before we can get there is kind of agree as a community and begin to play around with what the default viewport for classic content is going to be. Um, the other thing we have to figure out is, is, is really determining what is a classic site and what is a full VR site. Um, imagine if I'm mobile, everyone was making mobile websites, but to actually kick into the mobile web rendering mode, you actually had to hit a button manually. It would really suck. I mean, you want to be served the mobile version, the optimized version for the device uh, automatically. And right now, you're not on the web. Uh, user agents, if you click on a link, uh, that's not a Moz VR link, but if you click on a link, you're going to be thrown out of VR mode and you're going to be back in desktop mode. Um, we need to find a way to have the user agent uh, understand and for the developer to, de to declare what kind of site they are so that we can uh, make browsing as seamless as possible so developers can optimize uh, their views. It's subtle, but it's really important to uh, the kind of the seamless web browsing, which is what we want to achieve. So uh, on the blog post, we'll send it on Tuesday. There'll be some proposals for that. Brandon's got some. It's really early conversation. There's some really smart people inside Google and Mozilla and in the web dev community um, who need to have a conversation about this, who, are, who really know this stuff. Um, but we're talking about like events or, or meta tags or even app protocols like VR protocol. Uh, we'll figure out what it is. Um, how many for time, Tony? About uh, five? OK, great. Um, uh, you know what? I'll jump to transitions then. Um, because transitions to me are really important for, uh, OK, transitions on the classic web are just blink, blink. You know, like page pops in, page pops out. It's pretty jarring. On VR, that could be really jarring. And moreover, I think it would be an enormous creative lost opportunity. So let's start playing around with transitions, um, both in the user agent, like uh, doing in-stream transitions. Again, these, these are going to be really heavy-handed because this is me just messing about on the weekends. But uh, it could be a lot of fun actually playing around with uh, how we actually move users between sites. So on MozVR, you saw that kind of black, white, wipe. Um, the user agents, I think, will have a ton of freedom to actually experiment with this. And I think also we can let developers experiment with this. So I think the Google Chrome team uh, recently, as part of the material push, have put forth a proposal to actually enable developers to determine the transition as you move between individual URLs. That's pretty interesting when you apply it to VR. So can a developer determine what the experience you see is when you move between two, to two URLs? Is it like leaping between two worlds? Is it like stepping through a doorway? Is it just a quick blink? Maybe we can let develop, we can empower developers to actually have control of that as well. It'd be pretty interesting. Uh, and then full VR browsing experience. Um, we're really early on this stuff. Uh, we're just trying to figure out how might this work exactly. Uh, you know, what kind of things would you want to have? How will text entry work? Uh, you know, text entry is going to be a really tough one. We have to figure out some kind of clever solutions. Maybe web VR design for the first little bit is more like Yahoo. It's like a, or it's a kind of like, uh, if you've seen a lot of uh, typically Chinese web design, it's, it's a ton of information density, a ton of links. And maybe it's not so much URL entry. Maybe we kind of have more of a, a directory approach to navigation. That might be interesting. Uh, we're trying to work out the basic conventions and like history representation, multitasking, how do we do that? 
Um, these are, again, by the way, all these mock-ups are using that technique I mentioned before, which is to say transparencies mapped onto a cylinder with a, uh, something in the background. Uh, so trying to figure out what, how full VR browsing is going to work and then uh, and what it's going to have to have. Um, we're really going to try and hack uh, for the next six months pretty intensely on this in a very public and open way. So I wanted to show you code today. I, I couldn't, which is why I'm showing you four different like uh, piles of, of slides and presentations. Um, but you'll see a lot more from us in the next couple months on this. Uh, hacking in the open and encouraging other people to, to, to kind of uh, uh, kick around ideas with us in terms of interaction and then development methodologies. Um, and then I can say I'll skip over additional platforms, additional input devices, et cetera, um, because I kind of want to wrap up by, by talking about something that, to me, it's, it's kind of a, a very vague, vaguely formed idea. It's not even tweetable, maybe, but I'll float it here. Um, the web on mobile, browsing on mobile, really suffered because you don't need a frame within a frame. Um, the browser's a frame, the operating system's a frame. There's not enough room on the screen to actually have both. Uh, so it was very awkward to have a browser within the smartphone. I mean, the smartphone, the operating system of the smartphone really took over the jobs we hired the web to do in a big way. Um, so general purpose browsing on, uh, on, on mobile uh, is, is not really that interesting. And if you look at the design, the interaction design, and if you look at the visual design of competing mobile browsers, like <laughs> there's very little difference between them. Like Firefox Roundup, which is a great mobile browser, it's distinguished by a swoop in the upper right-hand corner. It's a lovely swoop, but there's not a lot of creative freedom there to play. <laughs> Um, so what really excites me about VR, and what I think is maybe subtle, is uh, the amount of variance, the amount of uh, the massive amount of creative um, freedom that user agents are going to have to differentiate one another. Uh, so you can imagine what a power user browser from like a neuromancer snow crash addict might actually look like, and how radically it might actually be from like let's say a, a browser made for made for like uh, I, you know, let's say a child, you know, a safe browser. You can imagine browsers competing based on Maybe anthropomorphization of security threats. So a security threat could actually manifest itself as flies buzzing around you, or your trackers could be cans dragging behind you. Um, one one like kind of scary uh, consequence of WebVR will be when guys like the 4chan crew get their hand on it, and the kind of gnarly, crazy, scary shit they could render right in front of you right here. <laughs> so, so maybe user agents will compete based on security. So one can imagine that one security one user agent might actually, as a feature, roll out like a, a geometry occlusion device which is to say that you as a user can set a range within which all geometry of the rendered scene is occluded. So nothing can be put right here. And all volume is automatically muted and slowly ramped up when you get into a site. Um, I think that there's going to be a massive amount of competitive potential between user agents and WebVR in a way there never was in browsing. And I think if we do a good enough job of making really compelling web content, that people will want to use these user agents to actually browse the web. So I'm very, 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 very excited for where the web's going to go in the next couple of years. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, there's more I can say, but I, there'll be a blog post out um, uh, on Tuesday about this stuff, along with a newly relaunched mozvr.com. Uh, we're going to relaunch it to make it really uh, great as a developer resource for anyone who wants to make these kind of websites. So a lot of content there, a lot of blog posts, a lot of tutorials, a lot more code samples to help developers just start making stuff. Uh, and then lastly, what I'll say is Tony mentioned that uh, uh, nightly builds of Firefox are going to get uh, a web VR support. They actually have it. Uh, you just need, to, you need a couple extra steps, and we're going to, on Tuesday, outline what those steps are. But uh, it's really good news, because it means that WebVR is now in our main uh, releases. And uh, from there, it spreads out into Firefox proper to lots and lots and lots of people. So that's really a good thing. Um, so thank you very much. I think that, holy crap, I almost nailed it, right, in terms of time. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so thanks so much for having us, too. And by the way, I'm really lazy, and I love it when people have meetups that are 20 doors, 20 feet meters from the front door of my office. <laughs> <laughs> so just, so Google you. can keep hosting them here. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.